<laughs> uh, I could do. Around that five dollars. <laughs> might not get it back though. Everybody would be so distracted. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Go B. I'd like to see the people a bit. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good morning. Our seminar speaker today is Doug Hemingway. Most of you probably know Doug. He's a postdoc here. Started last year. And uh, my hands are full, so I can't pull out your CV, but let me see if I can recite it. He got his bachelor's at Waterloo in okay. systems engineering, something like that, and then got a master's in... University of Space Studies in Strasbourg? International Space University. Oh, that one. Yeah. yeah. Close. It's and got a title that sounds kind of made up, but it's, it's a real place. <laughs> Strasbourg, yeah, sounds yeah. made up. Uh, and then he got his PhD at UC Santa Cruz in Earth and Planetary Sciences uh, and, and finished a Miller Fellowship about a year ago and then moved here to work with us. And Doug took a couple years off before his, between his bachelor's and his PhD and worked uh, in the, with the Canadian Space Agency on the arm of the International Space Station. And as it was just showing us uh, the, the, the printed arm on the Canadian $5 bill. So maybe he'll pass that around so we can take a look <laughs> at it. So today he's going to tell us about uh, his, his more recent work on icy wor world interiors. All right. Thanks for the introduction, Peter. Uh, everybody can hear me okay? All right. So yeah, I wanted to first zoom out, though, before I jump into this talk and give you a little bit of a more of an overview of my interests. Really, I have very broad interests in uh, planetary science. I want to understand really all the geophysical processes that drive the evolution and behavior of planetary bodies of all kinds, what gives rise to all the diversity we see ultimately everywhere, but especially across our own solar system. And even if you set aside the giant planets, there's a really rich diversity just among the smaller rocky and icy bodies in our solar system. This is a composite showing all the ones that are large enough to have relaxed to near spherical symmetry. And what I want to show you today is that even if you zoom in into a relatively narrow category, there's still a lot of diversity uh, even at that level. So I'm going to talk about the interiors of icy ocean worlds. And uh, the reason is because this is, I think, a really important class of planetary body because these little worlds, I think, represent maybe one of our best opportunities for discovering direct evidence of life beyond Earth. They have all the right ingredients, plenty of liquid water. There's an energy source. Uh, in some cases, we know there's organic molecules present. And in the case of Enceladus, which is the one that's illustrated in front here, we also have these active eruptions that are right now making that ocean material available above the surface. So you don't even have to figure out how to land and drill through the ice. You can just fly through that plume of erupting material with the right complement of instruments and uh, maybe be able to detect whether there's biological organisms there. And there's a real chance that we could do this, and people are working on it anyway. Uh, maybe there's a chance that we could do this in the next couple of decades. So it's easy enough to see why we're motivated to study these bodies, but there's still a lot we don't understand. Uh, in particular, I'm going to focus, and especially in the later part of the talk, on the ice shell structure. The ice shell structure is very important for understanding the heat budget, um, the longevity of these oceans, and the nature of any ocean surface pathways that may exist. Um, but a more basic question is, how do we know that these subsurface oceans are even present? In other words, how did I make these diagrams, right? We don't have seismic stations out there, at least not yet. So in the meantime, we have to rely on some kind of other techniques, and that's what a lot of this talk is going to be about. So uh, there's a number of at least candidate ocean worlds that we could talk about. I'm going to focus mainly on these three. This is uh, one of Jupiter's moons, Europa, and then two of Saturn's moons, Enceladus and Titan. Uh, now Europa, you maybe know, is kind of the prototypical. Well, yeah, the reason to do this is because there's kind of a cross section. Like I said, just even within this kind of narrow category, you're going to see that there's quite a diversity of different techniques that are applicable and also different physics that's going on. So I'll start with Europa. Uh, this is kind of the prototypical icy ocean world. It's the first place that people were confident had an internal liquid water ocean. Uh, that was from the Galileo spacecraft in the late 90s. And it's also the next one that we're going to be visiting up close with spacecraft. So we have uh, the Europa Clipper mission, which is due to launch in just a couple of years. Uh, and Europa got even more interesting just a few years ago when we started to see evidence of at least episodic eruptions taking place on Europa. So nothing as dramatic as the ongoing eruptions at Enceladus, but at least there's some possibility that there's present day communication between the uh, ocean and the surface, which is potentially helpful. So switching over to Titan, Titan's a very different kind of ocean world. It's much larger. Uh, it's larger than the planet Mercury. 
It's the only moon in the solar system that has a big, thick atmosphere. It's this hazy atmosphere that is opaque. Uh, if you look in UV and IR, you can see a little bit of the surface. And especially using the radar instrument that Cassini carried, you can start to get really detailed. These are radar swaths. You can get really detailed picture of the surface. And you can see there's a lot of interesting things going on there. The fact that you have this atmosphere that can support weather, you get rain and rivers and lakes and seas, and it's just a fascinating place. Now, of course, the surface temperature is 90 Kelvin. So this, these rivers are not made of water. These are liquid hydrocarbons we're talking about. And the rock that they're carving into is ma mainly H2O. So I will say a little bit more later about both Titan and Europa, but mainly I'm going to be focusing on Enceladus. Because although it's tiny, I would argue that it's one of the most interesting places in the solar system. And uh, we've knew, known this all the way back from Voyager. Uh, first of all, it's the brightest object in the solar system. And we now understand that's essentially because it's covered in its own fresh snow. These eruptions are snowing back down onto the surface, keeping the surface very bright. It's also got a very young surface. You do see some craters. But there's also vast portions of the surface that are totally uncratered and also heavily tectonized, suggesting some maybe recent and even possibly ongoing geologic activity. And it wasn't really until, though, uh, the Cassini spacecraft arrived in 2004 that we started seeing more dramatic evidence of this, including these spectacular backlit images showing eruptions of water ice spraying out uh, along the lengths of these, this series of parallel fractures in the South Polar region. And it wasn't initially obvious where this was coming from, whether it was being generated, say, due to friction along those fractures at the surface, or whether it was sourced from some deeper liquid water reservoir, which, of course, would be more interesting from an astrobiological perspective. Um, but it really wasn't until just a few years ago that a series of geodetic measurements came together and allowed us to come to this, what I would call kind of our modern picture of the interior of Enceladus. A uh, large, low-density, rocky core surrounded by a global liquid water ocean. And then on top of that, an ice shell of considerable lateral shell thickness variations, which will be important later. And I should point out, this is all to scale. So like I said, most of the talk is going to be about how we come to this picture. So the first part, I'm going to go through some of the techniques that we use to come to that picture. And then just in the last part, I'll get into the implications of the ice shell structure that we end up with. And I want to say that please feel free to interrupt at any, any point with questions. I'm um, happy to do that as we go along. OK, so the first technique that I'm going to talk about involves taking advantage of asymmetries in the shape and gravitational field. So I said that we're talking about bodies that are large enough to have relaxed to near spherical symmetry, but none of them are quite symmetric because they're all spinning. So they experience some centrifugal flattening, some rotational flattening here. Uh, and then all of them are, all these large satellites in the solar system are tidally locked to their parent body. So they're in synchronous rotation. That means their prime meridian is constantly pointed at the primary, in this case, Saturn we're talking about. And so that means the tidal forces are kind of lined up in the same place all the time, and they get stretched out. And so the thing gets stretched out, gets elongated into this kind of a rugby ball shape um, that's permanent tidal bulge. And the combined effect gives you a sort of a triaxial ellipsoidal figure uh, like this. Um, don't worry about the equations. They're just there if somebody wants to understand exactly how the ratios come out. But it's, it's this triaxial ellipsoidal figure is described very well with a degree 2 spherical harmonic expansion with just two non-zero coefficients. So C2,0 describes the latitudinal variation, and C2,2 describes the longitudinal variation in the signal. And if you're not used to working with spherical harmonics, it doesn't matter. I'll always remind you that we're just talking about breaking the signal into latitudinal and longitudinal variations. And it's useful to do that because for synchronous satellites that are in hydrostatic equilibrium that have relaxed to that hydrostatic equilibrium, these coefficients come in a characteristic ratio, which is about 10 thirds. And so now I'm plotting, uh, this is the amplitude of the latitudinal and longitudinal variations in the shape in this case. And then the dashed line represents the expectation for a body that's relaxed to that hydrostatic equilibrium where it's supported by just internal pressure and, and the, between, the balance between pressure and gravity and nothing to do with the strength of the materials on long time scales. So usefully, where the body plots along this line is a function of its interior structure. So bodies that are strongly differentiated experience relatively little tidal and rotational deformation. And bodies that are more uniform interior ex experience more lar uh, larger amplitude uh, deformation. And so this is, this is useful. Um, and we're going to be able to use that in a minute. And I should say that this, I've kind of explained all this in terms of the shape, but this whole argument carries over to the gravitational field as well, because those asymmetries in the figure give rise to corresponding asymmetries in the gravitational field. And you can plot it the same way. It's the same coefficients, and they come in the same ratio. The only difference is I'm going to often follow the convention that's used with gravity to refer to the zonal term here as J2. But let's not get hung up on that. OK, so let's look at some, yes, question. Um, 
They're not, uh, it depends what you mean by opposite direction. They're not opposing each other, um, but they're, yeah, they're kind of orthogonal. But I mean, really it comes down to, and this is why I put these equations here, there's this flattening, the two zero, of course, is just the uh, latitudinal variation from the flattening, and then the tidal elongation gives you this fit figure, which you, if you translate into the coordinates you know, centered on the pole, spin pole, assuming it's zero obliquity, you get a, it breaks down into an additional component adding on to top of this, plus a component uh, in the longitudinal sense. And then you break it apart again and you end up with this 10 thirds ratio. Okay, so let's look at some real numbers now. Um, this is the expected shape and gravitational field for a relaxed, uh, hypothetical relaxed Europa. And so these are real numbers now, and I've done this calculation. Again, the hydrostatic line there is the dashed line. Now I've added some numbers on there, to, and those represent moment of inertia factor. So um, maybe you remember for a uniform sphere, the moment of inertia factor is 0 0.4, two fifths. And 0.3 for reference would be, would make this the most strongly differentiated solid body in the solar system. And as a point of reference, the Earth's moment of inertia factor is about 0.33, so it'd be about here. So that's what we'd expect. Now let's look at some measurements that we got from the Galileo spacecraft. Uh, here we have the shape and the gravity. And it's okay to laugh at the large air ellipse on the, <laughs> on the Europa. So we do certainly, we have a measurement of the shape of Europa, and it's certainly compatible with hydrostatic equilibrium, but this is a one sigma air ellipse, so it's not terribly useful. It doesn't tell us anything about uh, where exactly we are on that line, which is what we'd like to know to know the radial density structure. The gravity is much better. It's much more precisely determined, but this is slightly misleading, though, anyway, because um, although... Although it's kind of a small air ellipse, it's artificially collapsed onto that hydrostatic line because it wasn't possible to measure J2 and C22 independently, and so instead hydrostatic equilibrium was just assumed, and so it's kind of flat on there. Uh, but nevertheless, it does give us an idea of the radial density structure. It's not completely unique, but you can start to put together a picture of the interior of um, Europa. Here we have a metallic core, a rocky mantle, and then some kind of H2O envelope. Now, with density, you can't tell the difference between water and ice, uh, but uh, you can infer the presence of an internal liquid water ocean from a completely different uh, piece of information. And that has to do with Jupiter's magnetic field. So conveniently in the Jupiter system, the Jupiter's magnetic field is tilted by about 10 degrees from its spin axis. So as Jupiter's spinning on a, on a 10 hour period, all the satellites are seeing this time varying magnetic field. And so if there's a electrically conductive uh, layer at depth, like a salty liquid water ocean, then that's going to induce currents in, those, in that ocean, and there's going to be an induced magnetic field. And that was what was measured by the Galileo spacecraft, and that's how we know about the presence of this internal ocean. Now, it turns out this technique doesn't work at all in the Saturn system because, unfortunately, the Saturn's uh, magnetic field is perfectly, basically perfectly aligned with the spin axis. So the, the magnetic field is not time varying from the point of view of the satellites. It's just completely symmetric. So we have to use some other techniques, which we'll get into here. On the other hand, we have much better measurements at, uh, in the Saturn system. So now this is Cassini data. Um, and we have a much better measurement of the shape and the gravitational field, much smaller uh, air ellipses just because we have more data. Uh, but you also notice there's kind of a bit of a problem here, right? First of all, neither the shape nor the gravitational field is in line with that hydrostatic expectation. So you want to be able to just plot it on that line and read off your radial density structure, but you can't. There's a problem here. Uh, and not only that, but the, the relationship between these measurements and the hydrostatic expectation is inconsistent, mutually inconsistent between those two. So we're going to have to do something more, and that's going to get more involved in a minute. But first, let me take a minute to say where these measurements even come from. So the shape determination comes basically from just looking at images like this one. So if you, every image you have like this, you can kind of look at the profile of the limb, the illuminated limb there, and you get basically elevation data along that limb. And if you have enough images like this from enough different viewing geometries, you get elevation profiles crisscrossing the surface. And so you can use that to constrain a global shape model. And so here what we're seeing is that global shape model for Enceladus. Uh, mostly what you see is that triaxial ellipsoidal figure, that kind of squashed rugby ball pattern. But there's some smaller bumps and wiggles corresponding to just a more smaller effects on the topography. And then there's this kind of large topographic depression at the South Pole, which I want to bring your attention to because it's going to be important later. OK, the measurement of the gravitational field, I think, is really interesting because there isn't really an instrument exactly for measuring this. All you can really do is pay very close attention to the trajectory of the spacecraft during close gravitational encounters with the body of interest. And when you get close enough, mostly the spacecraft is going to feel only the gra gravitational field from Saturn. But if it gets close enough, it starts to get influenced by that little satellite. Uh, and the case of Enceladus was 
Uh, oh yeah, and the way you actually measure this, you can't actually track the thing in the sky. It's just a, it's all just a point in the sky. So the only way you're really measuring this is by maintaining a constant radio communication during the encounter. And then what happens is some component of the accelerations that the spacecraft are feeling are going to be along the line of sight with Earth, and that's going to give you a Doppler shift in the radio link. And that's all that's actually measured. And from that, and then a model of you know, knowing where everything is supposed to be in the solar system, you can back out what the gravitational field of this little guy has to be in order to have, uh, you know, reproduce those Doppler, uh, those Doppler shifts. So this is the me measurement that you end up getting. It was kind of hard for Enceladus because it's so small. Its influence on the spacecraft trajectory is really tiny. Also, two of the three flybys involved flying over the South Pole where there's this erupting material, and so there was a drag component on the spacecraft that had to be modeled out. Uh, and once that was all done, finally in 2014, we had this picture of the gravitational field for Enceladus. And mostly what you're seeing is that effect of that triaxial ellipsoidal figure, um, which again breaks down into J2 and C22. But if you delete those components, if I hide those, you can see that there's a little bit more information here as well. We also have what we call J3. So J3 is again a latitudinal variation in the gravitational field, but it's the next harmonic up. So it's the first odd function. So it picks up this north-south polar asymmetry. And one thing you notice here is there's a low at the south pole. There's a little like, less gravitational pull at the south pole because of the missing mass associated with that topographic depression. And it's going to be the ratio between those two things that's going to be useful in a minute. OK, so what do we do with this situation? We have an imperfectly hydrostatic body. What can we do? Well, one thing we can do is we can think of it as a mostly hydrostatic body. So pick a point on the hydrostatic line, and then say that's superimposed with some non-hydrostatic topography. So, so non-hydrostatic topography means something, there's a little bit of strength in the outer, cold, rigid part of the ice shell that can support some departure from this hydrostatic equilibrium. That's the purple arrow. And then the correspond, there's some corresponding non-hydrostatic gravity. And now when you plot it this way, you'll notice that there's quite a lot of non-hydrostatic topography, but only a little bit of non-hydrostatic gravity. And so that is an indication that this is compensated topography. So that just means that there's something, this extra mass associated with the topography is not showing up in the gravitational field because there's something at depth, some internal density anomaly that's offsetting that effect. And that brings us to the idea of isostatic equilibrium. Any questions so far about that? Yeah. I was hoping somebody would ask that. That's a great question. And that's actually the subject of the whole next part of the talk. <laughs> Um, but yeah, exactly. That's the problem. We don't know where to begin with that. And so it's going to be a bit of a parameter space exploration to find what point on that allows you to be mutually consistent in terms of the uh, moment of inertia you're assuming, and also mutually consistent in terms of what is telling you about that compensation mechanism, which I need to explain now. But yeah, great question. OK, so this is going to be worth going over isostatic equilibrium here. The way I think about it, uh, on the left, what I'm showing here is you just have vacuum. I don't know how well you can read that. This is a crust, it doesn't matter. I've, I've kind of drawn this as white and blue as if it's ice sitting on top of a liquid water ocean, but it doesn't matter. All that matters is that you have a relatively stiff crust or relatively high viscosity crust, say, sitting on top of a higher density, lower viscosity material that I'll call the mantle. And so in this case, on the left panel, there's nothing very interesting happening. You have no topography. Uh, in the middle now, I've imposed a topographic anomaly. And what that does is now that's going to mean that your overburden pressure, your hydrostatic pressure at depth here in this low viscosity layer is high underneath the high standing topography and low underneath the low standing topography. And so there's going to be a lateral gradient in that pressure, hydrostatic pressure. And because this material is low viscosity or relatively, it's going to behave like a fluid on long time scales. That's going to induce lateral flow in that low viscosity layer. And that flow is going to continue until those lateral pressure gradients are eliminated when you get to this point where this is sunk down to the point where it's essentially floating like this crust is floating on the mantle. So this is kind of your, you can think of it as like the floating iceberg model for uh, isostatic equilibrium, airy isostasy. OK, and you'll see what later why it was worth going over that. But so what this does to the gravity is now you have, where you have this high standing topography, the extra contribution that that makes to the gravity is offset by the fact that you have, this is lower density than the fluid it's sitting in. So there's this mass deficit, essentially, associated with isostatic root. And then how effectively that cancels things out is a function of the compensation depth. So if the compensation depth is very shallow, you have this positive mass anomaly and negative mass anomaly right next to each other, they essentially cancel out. But less so if you have a deeper compensation depth. OK, so now we're getting into this part here. And what I mean by mutually consistent there is that this topography has to be supported in some way that you're canceling it out down to this very small, canceling out the gravity signal down to something like that. And so again, that's getting, getting at your compensation depth. 
So at first it looked like we had a problem here. We have this imperfectly hydrostatic body, but it's kind of an opportunity to learn something additionally that we wouldn't otherwise been able to do, which is get at the compensation depth as well, if we can find a way to get this all to work uh, self-consistently. So the process, uh, the modeling process that I've gone through here is I make a radial density structure, compute the expected hydrostatic equilibrium figures for all the layers. Now I replace the outer layer with the observed topography, and then I impose that the boundary between the ice and the ocean is whatever it needs to be in order to produce isostatic equilibrium, so you have no lateral pressure gradients in the ocean, um, so it's an equilibrium situation. And then I compute the gravitational field from that and compare that to the observations. Now, of course, I don't know the radial density structure to start with. That was your point. And so the whole point here is to do this iteratively across a whole parameter space to see if I can find a solution that works. And so this is what it looks like when I map out parameter space. So this is just one partial way of looking at it, but I can consider a range of possible shell thicknesses and a range of possible ocean thicknesses, and I'm illustrating the extremes of the parameter space on the corners there. So you have a uniform interior here. Here it's very strongly differentiated, thick ocean, thick ice shell. Uh, and then I can plot whatever parameter I care about across this parameter space. So here I'm plotting J2, so again the latitudinal variation in the gravitational field. And as I mentioned at the beginning, bodies that are strongly differentiated experience relatively little tidal and de rotational deformation. And so the J2, the gravitational uh, asymmetry in the gravitational field is smaller. And then it's larger when you go to a, a more uniform body. So now what I can do is isolate the part of this parameter space that matches the observation. And that's this blue line here. And then the thick band around it is the one sigma uncertainty on that line. I can do the same thing now for C22, the longitudinal variation in the gravitational field. You get this other line kind of intersecting at a steep angle. Uh, unfortunately, they kind of overlap a lot, so they're, they're not really very independent. Um, that's because both of them depend on the radial density structure to a strong degree. But I can also bring in J3. So J3 is that north-south polar asymmetry, and that is completely independent of uh, ocean thickness. And so it usefully cuts across this at a steep angle. And so now we have an intersection between these three curves, and that gives us our interior structure model for Enceladus. Now this is the same paper that I mentioned uh, earlier in the context of measuring the gravitational field, but now I'm talking about the uh, interior modeling part of that paper. It's kind of a joint paper between, in pink, the radio science folks, and then in blue, those of us who are doing the interior modeling. And so that's the picture that we got back in 2014, and that's still, you know, broadly speaking, that's still correct. That's more or less what I think it looks like in, in the interior, but because, as I'll explain more later, it's really important to get the ice shell structure right it turns out there's a bunch of subtle things that come in here that uh, need to be taken into account to get this picture right. And it could make you know, big differences, like a factor of two or three. So um, the first one was shortly after our paper came out, a colleague noticed that the first order equilibrium figure theory that I kind of explained earlier that we were using is a good approximation generally, but not so much for Enceladus because of its fast rotation. And so taking that into account, you kind of readjust all this analysis, and these curves shift around a little bit. It's kind of a subtle difference. But you'll notice now you don't have a nice intersection between those three curves anymore. Uh, there's a little bit of a gap there. It's not horrible, but it's about to get worse, actually, because <laughs> there's another correction that comes in. Um, another thing that we did was when we're trying to measure the contribution of the topography onto the gravitational field, we basically just assume the whole thing's spherical and then treat that as surface density anomalies, which is a good approximation most of the time. But for the ice-ocean interface, the topography is actually quite large because the density contrast there is very small between the ice and the water. So you end up with such a large amount of topography, you can no longer approximate it, no longer good to approximate it as surface density anomalies on the sphere. You have to take into account the finite amplitude of that topography. So this is also known as a terrain correction. And we do that, and that shifts these curves again a little bit more. Again, it's still not horrible. There's some overlap here, but the two degree two curves no longer intersect in any physically plausible part of the parameter space. And also, you're starting to get a, quite a large shell thickness, uh, which, again, this is what I mean when I say it's, it's, um, it's important to get the shell thickness right. Because if you've doubled the shell thickness, you've cut the heat loss in half. We'll, cut, we'll come back to that in a minute. Yeah? Oh, yeah, they overlap within their uncertainties, yeah. I just meant that the center, the perfect number, you can't perfectly satisfy the observations. But. But you're right, there's, lot, there's enough overlap. That's why it's not so horrible yet. But it's about to get worse. Because <laughs> there's another constraint that we can bring into this, and this is where I get into the rotational dynamics part of this. OK, and specifically, I'm going to be talking about the physical libration amplitude. So because the orbit is elliptical, I told you that you know, we're talking about synchronous satellites, so they generally have their prime meridian, which is marked here with the blue arrow, always pointed at the prime, primary, in this case Saturn. Um, but that's not exactly true, because 
these orbits are a little bit elliptical. So the satellite's moving faster in this part of its orbit and slower in this part of its orbit. So it's actually, except for at periapsis and apoapsis, the, the center, uh, sorry, the prime meridian is basically pointed at the empty focus of the ellipse. So except for at pericenter and apocenter, there's a misalignment between the long axis of the satellite and the line connecting it with the primary, in this case, Saturn. And so that means that in this part of the orbit, you're getting torqued to the east, and in this other part of the orbit, you're getting torqued to the west. So superimposed on the mostly steady rotation rate, there's going to be a little bit of wobbling back and forth. It's very small. But if you can measure it, it tells you a lot of information because, of course, the amplitude of that rocking back and forth is going to be in function of the interior structure as well. And so I'm going to show you a little summary of this work that was done by this group at Cornell. They very carefully measured the libration amplitude. It's only 0.12 degrees, but they got reasonably small error bars. That's the gray band here. And what they showed is that, <clears throat> first of all, they independently confirmed that there has to be a global liquid water ocean there to decouple the ice shell from the interior because there was no model that they could come up with. Something like at, at a 10 sigma level, there was no model they could come up with where the ice shell is coupled to the interior and still has such a large libration amplitude. So it really has to have that decoupling layer so that the ice shell is free to rock back and forth more or less independently of what the deeper interior is doing. And that's also useful because now if it's just the ice shell more or less free to do that, then the amplitude of the libration is just a function of ice or inverse function of ice shell thickness. Because if you double the shell thickness, you double the moment of inertia of the shell, you cut its libration amplitude in half. And so that's what this blue sort of inverse curve is. And where that intersects the observation gives you an independent estimate of the shell thickness. So this is a totally independent measurement. We bring this back into the parameter space I was just showing you, and you get another constraint. And unhappily, <laughs> it's nowhere near the other one. So we're, we have a problem here. So what's the problem? Well, I think the problem has to do with the way we think about isostatic equilibrium, and that's why I spent so much time on that earlier. So let's talk about isostatic compensation. So again, the idea is you're, you want to be in equilibrium, you need to eliminate lateral pressure gradients at depth. Um, a lot of the time, you can think about this as above some datum, columns of equal width contain equal masses. Now, this equal masses conception is a physically different description of what's going on than this equal pressures or eliminating pressure gradients, but they give you the same equation. And so they're kind of used interchangeably. The way that's taught is sort of ambiguous sometimes. Um, but it only gives you the same equation if you're doing this in a Cartesian geometry, it turns out. When you take the spherical geometry into account, these two different ideas give rise to two different equations. Now, for Earth, it's not such a problem because we're usually talking about short wavelength features and uh, compensation depth that's a very small fraction of the radius. But for these smaller bodies, and especially Enceladus, where the compensation depth is something like 10% of the radius, the difference between these two equations is actually very significant. And so when you take this into account, now here's the picture you saw before with the equal masses conception. Implicitly, a lot of us have been using that for, well, people have been using it for decades uh, for these kinds of problems. If you just switch from equal masses conception to the equal pressures conception, you have a very big effect on where those curves are. So again, like, just that's the only thing I'm changing here is how we're thinking about isostasy. And now you get a situation where all four of those curves, they're not perfectly intersecting, but they're much closer to intersecting at a common point. So I think that was a quite helpful development. Uh, and now we can start to talk about a consistent, a self-consistent picture. So um, this is the same kind of thing now. I've you know, turned that into a misfit and then calculate a kind of a probability de density function across this parameter space. So this is a constraint on the shell and ocean thickness. And then this is the corresponding core radius and density. So this is what I said. There's a kind of a low density core, maybe hydrated silicates or um, silicates with a lot of porosity, some combination of those things. And this is the picture that we ended up with. And so the ice shell thickness, again, this is to scale. You can see there's a lot of lateral variation in the sh shell thickness, and that's going to be important. And the overall, the whole thing is very thin, actually. It's only maybe 20 kilometers on average. And this is the same thing shown in map view. Usually there's more questions. Are you sure there's not questions? <laughs> At the very center, you got about 35 megapascals. Megapascals. Not very much. It's small. The whole thing is only 500 kilometers in diameter. Yeah, you can have porosity all the way down. Yeah, or at least, yeah, right. And the gravity is so weak, yeah. So the last part of the talk, I'm going to get into the implications of this shell structure, but uh, are there any other questions about how we got to this point first? Yeah. Uh, no. 
because um, it's not a dynamic calculation at all, this isostatic equilibrium. You can debate whether that is a, is a good concept to even use, but um, the idea of equilibrium is just eliminating the pressure gradient. So you assume that on long time scales, the thing behaves like a fluid. The viscosity is low enough that it behaves like a fluid on long time scales. And certainly for water, that's not a problem. So you're talking about adjacent to the eruptions where you're piling up material. Ah, I see. So you kind of have like a 1D or a, like a, yeah, yeah. Um, so you have about uh, 200 kilograms per second coming out. Uh, it doesn't add up to very much over the long run, but it's still, um, yeah, because mostly, I mean, it's very fine stuff that's coming out. But uh, I haven't actually done the calculation in the way that you're talking about. But I think there's other dynamical effects on the ice shell that are going to swamp what you're talking about, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but yeah, it's a, good, it's a good point. Yeah. Yes, excellent question. So they're all at the South Pole. All the eruptions are happening at the South Pole where the ice shell is thinnest. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Yes, they vary a little bit during the orbit, uh, somewhat as you'd expect. You'd expect at certain parts of the orbit, you know, you're kind of crack, crack those uh, fissures are opening and closing on orbital timescales, and so the amount of stuff that's coming out will change on orbital timescales, and that's true. But it's an offset from everybody's expectations by about five hours. <laughs> and so that's uh, it's not 100% clear why, but uh, it could have to do with just the, the plumbing, the amount of you know, the communication between the surface and the, and the ocean. OK, so let's move on to the uh, implications of the shell structure that we ended up with here. So the first one to talk about is the heat budget. So and by heat budget, I mean, you know, what is the comparison between how much heat is being lost to how much heat is being generated or, develop, or produced in the interior? And are those things balanced? And a lot is made of the heat loss associated with the eruptions along those tiger stripes at the South Pole. And that's been estimated at something like 5 or 10 gigawatts, which would seem to be problematic uh, for explaining how you can generate that much heat inside this tiny little body. Uh, but the problem's actually, if the ice shell is as thin as I've just told you it is, then the problem's actually much worse than that. because just the conductive heat loss alone, if you have a very thin ice shell, you have very steep temperature gradients and very strong conductive heat loss. So you're losing another you know, 30 or 40 milliwatts per square meter over this, and you're integrating that up over the whole surface, you got a whole another 25 or 30 gigawatts. So we're actually looking at more like 40 gigawatts of heat loss, which would mean if, it wasn't something, if there wasn't something balancing that, then this whole ocean would freeze solid in a few, in like a few million years. And so it's, we need to come up with a heat source, otherwise we've we just happen to be seeing in solid at a very special time, and this, is, this ocean's a transient phenomenon. So what heat sources can we appeal to? Accretion heat is negligible for a body this small. Uh, radiogenic heat is potentially important. So here I'm showing, for bodies that are a mixture of ice and rock, how much uh, radiogenic heat flux you'd have resolved at the surface, and as a function of radius and bulk density. So if you're dense enough, like Europa, uh, or you're just plain large enough, like Titan, then you have enough rock in there that you're generating enough heat that at the surface you can you know, at least get close to maintaining a liquid water ocean, keeping it from freezing. But for Enceladus, it's just too small, just not enough rock in there to actually have a significant effect. So radiogenic heating is really not important. This is, I don't know if you can read that, it's 0.3 gigawatts. So it's really uh, like two orders of magnitude too small um, to actually be significant. So the only thing that we can really appeal to is tidal heating. Yes, question back there. Ah, yeah, that's a fair point. Uh, I, don't, I don't know the number for that in this case. Right. 
Yeah, I don't, that's why I say I don't know the number, but I'd be very surprised if it's like a significant contribution to the 30 gigawatts or that, we're, that we're talking about here. Um, yeah, Steely. Yeah, so I mean, in a conservative case, I'm talking about a conductive ice shell. So even if you set aside what's going on with the eruptions, there's certainly some advective heat loss associated with the eruptions. But never mind that, just put aside that for a second. Just the conductive heat loss, so we have some idea of the ocean temperature. You're right, we don't know exactly the sort of salt contents and exactly what the freezing point is. Uh, but say it's in the 270, neighborhood of 270, or even 260. I think in the paper I went down to 250, it doesn't really make very much difference. But even if you have a 250 Kelvin ocean at the top of the ocean, we know the surface temperature, uh, just the radiative equilibrium surface temperature is something like 75 Kelvin for uh, Enceladus. And just that and the shell thickness tells you the conductive heat loss. And that's what I'm going to get this here. Okay, let's talk about tidal heating for a second. So tidal heating, again, because you have this elliptical orbit, you have a situation where your tidal forces are time varying. So they're maximum at pericenter and minimum at apocenter. And in between, they're intermediate and also oblique. So on every orbit, you're kind of stretching and relaxing and stretching and relaxing this body. And so to the extent that some part of the interior behaves viscously on orbital time scale, you're going to be dissipating some heat that way in the interior. And so, uh, but you know, where exactly that heat is dissipated is not completely clear. I'm going to add a slide since there's a little bit of time here. Um, I have a little hidden slide here. So it's been known for a while that tidal heating could be important. Uh, and it's maybe important for, you know, it contributes for Europa and Titan, but there's also this radiogenic heat source, which is um, certainly the two of them together. It's not really a problem explaining how an how ocean persists on Titan or Europa. But for Enceladus, we have kind of a problem because we have this conductive heat loss on top of these eruptions, and radiogenic heating is not important. And tidal heating would seem to be, at least under classical assumptions about how much dissipation there is in Saturn, would be only around 1.1 gigawatts. So you have this problem of explaining how you have this internal liquid water ocean on Titan. So this is the dashed line. Is the, so this is a measurement of, uh, or sorry, a model of heat loss as a function of shell thickness. That's what this curve here is. And then the heat supply is uh, this dashed line. That's the tidal heating limit of 1.1 gigawatts, it's far, far short, no matter what you assume for the shell thickness, it's far too short to keep this thing in equilibrium. Yeah? It's not in liquid, it's in the, well, it's in the viscous part of the interior. So whether that's in the ice shell or the core is something that we'll talk about in a second. But um, yeah, there's possibly tidal heating, people are working on tidal heating in the ocean, but that would be not that viscous heating, it would be something to do with resonances. And, Okay, so, but there was a recent development uh, just a few years ago. There was an observation that there's a lot more dissipation in Saturn than anyone thought. And it turns out the actual amount of energy that's available to be transferred between sat from Saturn into these satellites is quite a lot more, something in the neighborhood of as much as 40 gigawatts. So you actually don't really have a problem now explaining the heat budget being balanced for Enceladus. So it's possible that this ocean's been around for a long time and could stay around for a long time. But there's still the question of how the dissipation, how you're actually dissipating that much heat and where in the interior. And so that was sort of your question, Peter, is like where is this being dissipated? Um, and so that's something that we, we wanted to investigate and we thought we would take advantage of this information we have about the shell structure. So again, this is the shell structure that you saw in map view. This is the corresponding uh, conductive heat loss. And on the right now is a tidal dissipation model, assuming the heating is happening in the low viscosity region near the base of the ice shell. So if that's where the heating is happening, you have the, visco the viscosity of the ice is low enough that it's actually shearing back and forth on every orbit. And the geometry of the situation is such that the maximum tidal heating occurs at the poles. It's minimum at the equator and especially at the prime and anti-meridians. And so for an ice shell to be in thermal equilibrium with that kind of dissipation, it's going to have to be the opposite. It's going to have to be thinnest at the poles in order to conductively remove all that heat out there. And it's going to be thicker at the equator and especially at the prime anti-meridians, and that's a lot like what we see. Obviously, there's some smaller bumps and wiggles that we're not catching here in this model, but broadly speaking, we are uh, approximately, this is approximately what you'd expect if the dissipation is happening in the ice shell. If the dissipation was happening in the core, by contrast, that now heat has to be communicated through this ocean, 
and it's going to be mixed, well mixed. You have a slow viscosity ocean, so it's not going to be able to get communicated that whatever patterns of heating that are happening in the core are going to have a hard time being communicated to the ice shell. Um, so we think this is an argument that at least some component of the dissipation is happening in the ice shell. Um, there is a little bit of a problem, though. You notice that the amplitude of, of shell thickness variations that we've inferred from the shape and gravity and libration observations is larger than what we predict from the model. And the, that's not so bad on its own, but it actually gets worse again. Uh, and this is getting into future work now, where in order to explain this, we're, this model is essentially assuming a static thermal equilibrium situation. But the system is going to be a little bit dynamic. So I've neglected in this model the fact that this thing is in thermal equilibrium, but it's not in gravitational equilibrium. So the fact that you have these shell thickness variations there, and especially the fact that the viscosity is relatively low at the base of the ice shell, this thing is going to want to relax gravitationally. So there's going to be some viscous relaxation of this ice shell. Now, there's going to be a feedback, and so that's going to tend to flatten out those shell thickness variations. There will be a feedback that restores the thermal equilibrium a little bit, because as you do this, you're going to thicken the ice at the equator, or at the poles. So now the ice shell is a little too thick at the poles to conductively remove all the heat that's being dissipated there. And so that's going to lead to some melting at the poles. And the opposite is going to happen at the equator, where the ice shell gets a little too thin. So now it's conductively removing more heat than you're actually dissipating there. And so there's going to be some crystallization of the ocean, some freezing. So you kind of have this conveyor belt of water freezing, relaxing, and going towards the poles and melting back again. And where the balances between these processes kind of depends on the viscosity and how quickly uh, this is all happening, what you come out to, and how, how strong those shell thickness variations are going to be. So let me illustrate that with a little movie. So here is just going to start out with a very thin ice shell. Um, and this is just a north-south polar cross-section through, through this. And you're going to see the thing evolve. And on the bottom, I'm showing the, um, this is, again, as a function of latitude, this is the heat flux. So the orange line represents the heat input, so from tidal heating. That's the tidal heating that's maximum at the poles and minimum at the equator. And then there's another line here that's purple, which shows the conductive heat loss. Um, now, that you don't see yet because it's off-scale high because the thing is so thin to begin with. But when I start the simulation, you see that it quickly evolves. This is with a very high viscosity starting point, so kind of close to this uh, thermal equilibrium situation, almost a static situation if you have high enough viscosity. It quickly evolves to a point where this is all in equilibrium. The conductive heat loss balances the heat input. But if you lower the viscosity, now you have the situation I was talking about there where you have a lot of relaxation, so you have to have ongoing melting and freezing uh, to, to Replace that, you have this discrepancy here. But you just can't maintain very strong shell thickness variations. One thing you could do is you could crank up the heat variation. So you can make the heat variation at the poles much stronger. And so now you have, in spite of the ongoing melting and freezing and the mismatch between the conductive uh, heat loss and the basal heat input, you still have shell thickness variations. But if you make the viscosity too low, then even with those really strong lateral variations in heat input, you just can't maintain any significant shell thickness variations. So really, one way or another, you need to have some significant amount of viscosity uh, in order to maintain any kind of shell thickness variations. So let me show that uh, in kind of a little summary cartoon here. This is now a relative, some measure of relative thickness variations as a function of uh, the viscosity at the base of the ice shell. And so, of course, if its viscosity is too low, you can't maintain anything. If the viscosity is high enough, you do maintain something. But even with this, with this nominal heat input pattern, uh, you just can't get in line with the observations, the observed amplitude of those uh, shell thickness variations. And that was the problem I was introducing before. But there's actually good reason to think that you may be able to have enhanced heating at the poles. So my tidal dissipation model assumed a uniform thin shell. But uh, if, you're, if your shell is already thinner at the poles, you're going to have larger amplitude variations. And especially if you have you know, eruptive activity there, and there may be other reasons that you're concentrating heating at the poles, at least at the South Pole. And so you could introduce you know, more dramatic uh, heating variations, lateral heating variations, and, allow, and that allows you to get up into this range that's compatible with the observations. Now, this is very preliminary. This is just uh, to give you an idea of some future work that needs to be done. But it's still kind of an open problem. Yeah, Colin. Yeah, it's a good question. So we, um, a lot of times you think, tw um, 10 to the 14 is a pretty common, um, Pascal seconds is a pretty common reference viscosity for, for water. And that's right here. It's like maybe enough, um, but it's not completely clear. But, but it's not impossible. Um, you could get something like 10 to the 16 is, um, I understand, is not unreasonable in this situation. 
but yeah, we did we did try. This is a oh, it's a Maxwell rheology in this in this model, but um, well, I'm not doing the dynamic part in this model, but anyway. Yeah. And so, what you what are you proposing to us? Well, I think it's just the not the the I, the um, rheologies are not just not that well understood in this regime anyway. We're talking about extremely low pressure gradients and uh, extremely long time scales. This relaxation is happening over millions of years, time, time scales. So knowing what the, how the ice actually behaves in those conditions is not uh, well known at this point. So it's not so much that we know it and we have to change it to get it into the right regime. It's just that it's kind of unknown. Yeah, John. Hmm. I mean, I know crater counting is, or crater relaxation is used to uh, estimate heat fluxes, but I think that's going the other way around. You're assuming something about the viscosity and then going to the heat flux from there. But um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Yeah, there's one back there. Well, certainly in the South Pole, where the heat flux is really high, sure. Um, yeah, with this map, with shelf atmospheric, I'm not sure that's been done, no. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. OK, um, so if we're done with that, I might move on to something else that we haven't talked about yet. We've talked about Enceladus and Europa. and I promise we talk about Titan as well. I haven't talked about that yet. But I want to add a little bonus because the technique, we talked about the techniques for measuring or knowing that these internal oceans are even there. For Europa, it was this magnetic induction. For Enceladus, it's all this gra gravity and topography and librations. Uh, but for Titan, the way we know about the internal ocean is completely different. And so there's kind of a bonus technique that I'll add here. And this, again, has to do with uh, the tidal response in a different way. So here again, the tidal forces are time varying. They're maximum here and minimum over here. So that means the thing is actually deforming on orbital time scales. So at different places in its orbit, it actually takes on a slightly different shape. And because we visited Titan so many times, it was the primary means of uh, reconfiguring the spacecraft's orbit. So we have something like 120 some flybys of Titan. And a number of those flybys involved gravity measurements. So uh, we actually measure the gravitational field at many different places in its orbit. And as a result, we don't just have an estimate of the average gravitational field for Titan, but we have a measurement or estimate of how the amplitude of that variation as it goes around its orbit. And the amplitude is much larger than it could possibly be if the ice shell were physically coupled to the interior. So again, it's similar to what we talked about with the librations on, on Enceladus, but it's, it's different. It's the amplitude of the, of the deformation. Uh, that's, that's so large that there has to be an internal, a decoupling internal liquid water ocean there. Another thing I didn't show you for Titan, we looked at pictures like this for Europa and Enceladus, but for Titan, uh, it's, first of all, it's different. The measurement's better than Europa for the shape, but uh, not as good as Enceladus. It's because you can't use imagery to look at the surface because of this opaque, uh, thick atmosphere. But with radar data, you actually, you know, there's radar altimetry and some shape model. Uh, we have Decent idea of what the shape looks like. And it's very, very far away from the hydrostatic expectation. That, that's certainly clear. And yet, the gravitational field is very close to the hydrostatic expectation. And so it's not at all clear. I consider this still kind of an open problem, explaining how you can have such a large body that should have relaxed to near hydrostatic equilibrium have so much departure in its uh, shape. And, uh, but just to remind you, there's other kind of processes that are available to maybe part ex partly explain this. And just as an example, this is some work we did a few years ago where to explain a geophysical signal at degree three, we needed not only a rigid ice shell that was very strong and able to support um, isostatic roots that are outside of isostatic equilibrium, but we also needed erosion at the surface. And you can do that because you have an atmosphere with, you probably can't see it, but there's little raindrops there. There's rain and weather that's you know, carving out rivers and moving sediment around on the surface. And so that's just an example that there's a whole other set of processes that are available. And that's kind of what I was getting at Back at the beginning when I said that there's, you know, on these different bodies, there's different physical processes that dominate on one or, or important on one but not on another. Uh, and then we also saw that there's 
whole different sets of techniques that are even available to probe these different things. And so that's kind of, I hope, hope this has sort of given you a picture of what I meant when I said that even when you narrow in on a fairly, fairly narrow uh, category, there's still quite a lot of diversity to look at. So um, I'll just sum up by saying that I hope that I've convinced you that this is a, both an interesting and also important class of planetary body. And that in spite of the fairly limited nature of the measurements that we can make in the outer solar system, there's quite a lot that we can do, quite a lot that we can learn about the interiors. But at the same time, there's still clearly some, a lot of open questions and a lot more interesting work ahead of us. So with that, I'll stop and I'll take any more questions that you might have. Thank you. Surely there's some more questions. Yeah, the problem with Titan is that um, um, the problem with Titan is that there's no non-hydrostatic gravity at all. You'd expect there to be some if this is like if the topography and gravity are at least spatially correlated. Non-hydrostatic topography and gravity are at least spatially correlated. Then you can do a kind of admittance analysis, like a and, and test this iso isostatic model. But in this case, there's other sources of gravity anomalies, like maybe some anomalies in the core. Uh, or just other, other sources of anomalies. Maybe there's um, density anomalies in the crust, and there's reason to think that that could happen just due to these like, interactions with this hydrocarbon cycle that's going on, on on Titan. There's reason to think that there might be density anomalies in the surface. So all of that superimposed on this makes the signal kind of go away to a point where we can't actually do the same kind of analysis at Titan, unfortunately. And Diane. Oh, sorry. Uh, Europa, yes, once we have better measurements. So as you recall, the error ellipse was so big on Europa that it was not useful. But when we have Europa Clipper, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, and I think it's, um, okay, I think there's a little bit more to the story that it's, um, it's not because, it's not that the uh, ice shell, I'm saying that the ice shell is thinnest there because of the eruptions, but well, a little bit, it's both. So I think it starts out with, because of the tidal heating pattern, you're going to have the ice shells going to be thinnest at the poles anyway, uh, to begin with. And if you have, so, so here's my hypothesis for why all this activity is at the South Pole, is you have... Um, some, if there's any period of secular cooling in the thermal history of Enceladus where you're, you have some net freezing of the ocean, then you're going to be pressurizing that ocean. So as you're freezing it, the volume change pressurizes the ocean, and now you're putting tension on that whole ice shell. Now, because the ice shell is in tension, at some point it's going to fail, and where it's going to fail is it's going to be where it's thinnest. So if, if it's half as thin at the equator, or the thickness is half as, at the equator or at the poles, you're going to be doubling the stresses there, more or less. And so the first place it's going to fail is going to be one of the poles. And I think it's a coin toss whether it's at the North Pole or the South Pole. But it's going to fail somewhere. And once it fails at one of those poles, now that mechanism is no longer available to drive that kind of fracturing. And so the activity then just concentrates at that pole. So once you have it at the South Pole, now, and I have this whole other paper that we we're working on where um, we think that the eruptions can kind of cascade out and cause this cascading series of failures so that you have these parallel fractures at the South Pole. And that, of course, wouldn't happen at the other pole. But now, once you've fractured it and you've got all these eruptions going on there, there's some additional sort of heating because you're also transporting heat through the, like, you know, this advective heat there. So you're going to be some additional um, heating from that. But then there's also additional deformation because once the thing's broken, it actually responds a lot more to those tidal on orbital time scales. And so that can also enhance the heating there. So I think that can ac account for the north south polar difference in the shell thickness. But yeah, the reason it's overall shell thin in the first place down there is just tidal heating, I think. That's my, that's my best guess for now. <laughs> Any more? Was there somebody back there? Yeah, Jonathan. All right, this is. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think it's mostly the latter, actually. I mean, people, of course, have been using gravity and topography for a long time, but how to do it at degree two, where you have this complication of this uh, superimposed tidal and rotational deformation, mostly people start their analysis at like shorter wavelengths, where you can actually expect there to be a good correlation between the topography and the gravity. But at degree two, it's complicated, because you need to also deal with this um, moment of inertia and how much you know, tidal and rotational deformation you have. So I don't think that had been done, actually, before. And we didn't think of it until the data were available to us, and we were, had to figure out how to work with just degree two, mostly degree two data. As for the libration thing, that also came up after the fact. So of course, there's a camera, and it's doing all kinds of things. But it wasn't until we got to the point where we measured this, and we thought, yeah, if we think there's an ocean here. We think it's probably global. We can't be sure. And then someone asked, how would we tell? And we said, well, one thing is the libration amplitude. I mean, I think people have thought of that before, but it hadn't actually, I don't think it was planned to be done on this mission. And it was really careful work. It took them, they had to compile seven years worth of imagery, looking at all these craters from all these different angles and do this whole control point network to measure that very subtle signal and then be very careful with the statistics to make sure that it was a good real signal. So yeah, that, a lot of it came up after the fact. Yeah. Ah, people have tried to check that. Um, first of all, the pattern is quite different because where the dissipation happens, it depends how thick the layer is and where it is. The pattern can be quite different at the surface. Uh, but yeah, people have, people have been working on that. But um, uh, I don't know that it's super clear. No. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Oh, thank you, yeah. Um, I am quite intrigued about that five-minute lag. Five hours. 